Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in tonight for Richard French. This has been another day of protests across America as we take you to an image out of Miami. Huge crowds continuing to demonstrate this group laying prone on the ground as part of their protest. We head into this weekend with the country remaining on edge. Protests continuing. A pandemic still taking the lives of Americans. Now 110,000 lost and counting. But we did actually get some good economic news today. That led President Trump to say this as he attempted to conflate several different stories. It is as tone deaf as anything we have heard from this president, and that is saying something. Hopefully George is looking down right now and saying this is a great thing that's happening for our country. This is a great day for him. It's a great day for everybody. This is a great day for everybody. This is a great, great day in terms of equality. It's really what our Constitution requires, and it's what our country is all about. It's a great day for George Floyd. Perhaps you should ask him yourself, Mr. President, if only you could. Just yesterday, friends and family gathered in Minneapolis to remember Floyd just days after he was killed by police. His body is now being taken to North Carolina for a service there before being returned to Houston. That's where his family lives. There'll be a viewing and a funeral there early next week. But it should not just be the family of George Floyd wondering about the president's tone deafness or asking what country the president is seeing on his television. Tens of millions of Americans remain out of a job while tens of thousands remain so angry they continue to hit the streets in protest. And our president met that unease this morning with ramblings and utterly self-centered nonsense like this. People are traveling and you know what? They're traveling in the United States and they're also driving. And they're building the uh, trailers. They're building a lot of things. They're driving. People are, people are driving. I may have to buy one of those things, drive around town. Maybe I'll drive back to New York with our First Lady in a trailer. What do they call that? Double RV. An RV. An RV. Well, you should know Indiana is the capital of RVs. <laughs> I think I'm going to buy an RV and travel from now on in an RV with our First Lady. I don't think anybody would mind that. The president of the United States there on a serious day of news around the country. And while the president is clowning around, the White House, which is supposed to be the people's house, is instead being turned into a fortress. New barriers and fences have just been installed as the president tries to insulate himself from the anger of the American people. And there is a new mounting frustration for Americans on this Friday, not just the one pushing people into the streets in anger, as we've been seeing, it's coming in reaction to scenes like this one. Police in Buffalo pushing a 75-year-old man to the ground. One of several examples of police meeting protesters with violence. Two of the Buffalo officers have been suspended without pay, but that does not make up for what happened. It's important to pause and note that the videos we're seeing of police and protesters are the most extreme examples. Most protesters are peaceful, but some have looted while others have looked to cause violence. Just as most police officers have performed with bravery and honor this week, but not all of them, and they are the ones we see in the videos. The New York Times taking note of both, but taking a bite out of New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, demanding he open his eyes, saying the police are out of control. Quoting from the editorial, many police officers are performing with grace under difficult conditions. Some have been injured in the line of duty, and it cannot be easy for men and women sworn to protect the public to hear themselves accused by demonstrators as threats to society. But Mr. de Blasio, the editorial continues, appears unwilling to confront the reality that the department is failing to meet the demands of this moment. Officers have been allowed to behave in a manner that disgraces their mission to protect and serve and violates the public trust. And it's not just happening in New York City. Let's bring in our next guest now. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill is a Democrat from New Jersey. She's also a former Navy pilot. Congresswoman, given your background in the Navy, I obviously have a lot of questions for you about the use of the military in Washington and elsewhere this week. But first, as both a congresswoman and a former federal prosecutor, I wanted to get your reaction to the protests we've seen, the looting and other acts of civil unrest, and also what looks to a lot of people like overly aggressive police responses. Who needs to do better and how can they do better? 
Um, that's a great question. And we've seen here in New Jersey a lot of more peaceful protests. And some of the, uh, the bad actors have come from outside. So now our cops are on alert. Uh, I've spoken to many of them who are anticipating protests this weekend. Uh, they're making sure that they're talking to community leaders and that the community's ready for peaceful protests. And then they're going to make sure that people coming from outside don't disrupt that. I think, uh, as we've seen some of the pictures from Washington, D.C., though, we haven't seen the same response. And I think that's because of um, sending so many guard troops down there, having the guard troops out. I think that exacerbates the situation. And I, I think that's probably why the D.C. mayor has asked that governors withdraw their guard troops. Well, let me ask you about that, because on Monday we had the defense secretary, the attorney general, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs by the president's side after the clearing of Lafayette Park. I'm curious, as a Navy veteran, what was your reaction seeing the military brass alongside the president in that moment? And what message do you think that sent to both the public and to our men and women in uniform? Well, as you know, I sit on the House Armed Services Committee, and um, we have asked for some answers to that. Some of the answers we got uh, were very odd. They said they didn't know that they were going there. They thought they were going to go review the troops. Um, you know, we've said to General Milley, he should not have been walking around in camis on the streets there. Uh, we said to Secretary Esper, he should not have been there. And, and I was glad to see that Secretary Esper then did come out and say, our military troops should not be performing this mission. Um, I'll also just say I, I'm a former Navy helicopter pilot. And what really disturbed me as well were the pictures of those helicopters, one of at least one of which had medical insignia on it, using the rotor washer, the downward air coming from the rotor stream, which is very powerful, um, and kicked up branches, glass on the street, knock, uh, presumably knocked some people over, um, using the rotor wash to clear the area. That is a military maneuver. I don't think that was appropriate um, to be used against peaceful protesters on our streets here at home. As you know, General Mattis and other formal, former military leaders, but Mattis in particular called the president a threat to the Constitution and blasted the president's desire to use the active military against protesters. It was an extraordinary comment that the president is a threat. Do you agree and do you get a sense from your Republican colleagues that there's any movement on this, that, that the president needs to be confronted a little bit more? That, you know, that really was extraordinary. Um, we first saw Admiral Mullen coming out, a former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then we saw um, Secretary Mattis come out, the former Secretary of Defense. These are military men who generally don't get uh, very political in some of these situations. Um, we haven't seen them coming out this thus far. And to have him speak so forcefully against these actions, I think, shows how deeply concerned and upset our military members and veterans are with the purported use of the military against people exercising their constitutional rights. Um, I, I, I can just tell by his statement how deeply disturbed he was. I was certainly very disturbed. Um, but I, I guess as shocking as the statement was, it wasn't surprising. These are men who've also taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against enemies foreign and domestic many times. And I think they felt uh, strongly enough that they had to stand up and do just that. Congresswoman, I'm sure you saw those unidentified groups in military-style get-ups in Washington this week. They would not identify themselves when asked by protesters or by journalists. They would not say what they were doing there. Reports suggest that many of them came from the Department of Prisons and were called to Washington by Attorney General Barr. Should prison guards be used for policing protests? You know, was that appropriate given the moment? And, and a lot of people are suggesting this feels sort of like a secret police for the president. So I think what we've all been very concerned about across the country is making sure that our police are trained to de-escalate situations. Um, it's something that I'll be going down to Washington to try to make sure they have the support they need to do just that with the training and some new reporting requirements, some new oversight requirements. Uh, but to think then that we are going to have people that aren't trained in some of that in a very difficult situation to police without the skills was concerning, to say the least. But then to see that we had police-type uh, people on our streets with no insignia, not identifying themselves, 
you know, I think it does bring to mind the secret police of old regimes. That's not appropriate in our country. That's not appropriate on our streets. It's not appropriate anywhere in this country, but certainly not in the nation's capital. It's certainly dangerous in the moment, Congresswoman, but there may be a bigger danger. And, and forgive me if I'm tiptoeing towards a conspiracy theory here, but we've seen our militia in Michigan and elsewhere. You could conceivably get gun-toting Rambos popping up wherever, acting like police, like those paramilitary groups we saw in Washington. Worst case scenario would be, let's say, November 4th. If the president was ever going to contest the election or refuse to give up power, wouldn't it look a lot like what we saw this week, unidentified paramilitary attacking Americans or at least putting themselves between them and the president? That's, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people are worried about right now, um, because that's how jarring and suspicious all of this is. And so I think as we look on this, this is why we have identity on police. We don't have secret police forces at the control of one man or one woman. Um, that's why we operate under certain parameters when you want to have military people on the streets of our nation in this country. Um, that's why we have um, so many, so many guards against this because uh, this is not how a democracy operates. When you have protesters, which to me is is as American as apple pie, it's the the Stamp Act and the Boston Tea Party and the suffragists and the civil rights movement. To think that you're going to shut that down with unidentified police forces could not be more anti-democratic and anti-American. Navy veteran and Democratic Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill representing the 11th District in New Jersey. Congresswoman, really appreciate a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And up next here on RFL, ABC News Chief Business Correspondent Rebecca Jarvis joins us to discuss the surprising good news we just got about the economy, what it all means, and of course the biggest question of all, will it last?